Station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready. Moxie Productions, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Rory Kennedy with Moxie Productions. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear on board the International Space Station. That's so cool. <laughs> yes, it is very cool. <laughs> so this is Peggy I'm speaking to now. That's correct. It's nice to speak with you, Peggy, and a huge honor. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us. No problem at all. This is a lot of fun being up here, and it's uh, great to try and share the experience. Thank you. So how, how, how is it up there? How does it feel to be back up in space? Well, you know, I thought maybe because I'm a little older and things have changed. It's been nine years since I'd flown, eight years since I'd flown. So I, I uh, thought maybe my attitude would be a little different. Uh, if anything, I think I'm enjoying it even more. Uh, it feels like the right place to be. That's fantastic. They need to interrupt. Oh, they need to te tell you something, Peggy, apparently. Apologies, please um, use your on-off switch between questions and answers. Okay, copy. Okay, how was the Soyuz ride up there, Peggy? That's when our, our crew was last with you. How was your voyage? Actually, the uh, Soyuz liftoff was even smoother than I remembered it being. Uh, the two days on board, uh, the Soyuz waiting to get to the space station, that was almost as boring as I remembered it would be. <laughs> My crewmates <laughs> were a lot of fun to chat with, but uh, it is a little bit uh, boring waiting to get here because there's just not that much you can do in the Soyuz. It's pretty small space. Well, I imagine it's uh, nerve-wracking, too, because, you know, there's still, with all the times you've been up there, there's the reality of, of the risks that you're taking and in going up into space. Well, there's always a risk associated with space flight, but that's just part of the, the job, part of exploration. There's always going to be risk, and it has to be something that we try and minimize. But, of course, we do have to accept that this isn't, you know, a simple job, and it's always very dangerous and risky. So tell me about your activities up there. Can you help us understand what you're, what you're up to and, and what you're working on and what your day-to-day -day life is like? Well, last week we did an incredible amount of different scientific investigations, uh, installing them and putting them in place uh, and starting them up. And uh, in one case we had a problem with uh, one that does combustion is an experiment that looks at combustion. And so we've spent some time troubleshooting that, trying to determine uh, what is wrong with the rack system that I can't remove the cartridge. It's a, it's a very complex uh, piece of hardware. And so we've done some very complex troubleshooting. Yesterday uh, and earlier today, we were doing some of the finishing up the servicing of the internal thermal control loops. So we have a huge variety of different things that we do on board the space station on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's just based on the needs and the priorities that are set to us from the ground. Uh, it's always fun, though. Uh, every day is a little different than the day before, and uh, we are always uh, directly contributing to space flight. So I get a kick out of it every single day. I bet you do. And how how are the is the impact on on you and your body? Are you are you feeling that? I imagine it's pretty extreme conditions to adapt to. Well, it's interesting. You know, on my first flight, I probably had the most uh, symptoms of being in space. Uh, they call it space motion sickness, but I really didn't have much of a sense problem coming uphill. But uh, I still didn't feel at home for probably about three weeks in the, in the sense that I wasn't hungry. Uh, it took my body some time to figure out uh, how to adjust and live in space. Uh, my second flight, 
I was adapted after I arrived on board station two days later, and this time I thought maybe because it had been so long that my body might have forgotten how to adapt, but I think maybe it was even faster. It seemed like I was comfortable from uh, the moment we were on orbit, and so it's, it's been great. Uh, I feel at home. Now, the place oh. is a lot bigger. Home's a lot bigger than it was last time I was here. Isn't that amazing? Gosh, it's so fun to think about. And how about looking down at, at Earth? How's our how's our planet looking? I know we've uh, elected a new president since you left, so you probably maybe you just want to stay up there for a little longer. Our planet is still just amazing. If anything, I think... I maybe forgot how much it actually glows. It is just so beautiful. It's hard to capture in pictures, but it, it really does glow. Um, and as I have talked to you a little bit before, I love the sunrises and the sunsets. They're my favorite times. And watching uh, that thin line, uh, the, it, it's just amazing with all, all incredible shades of blue. Uh, as the sun rises and as it sunsets, uh, just amazing colors. It's an, a, a beautiful view. And do you see the vulnerability of the Earth, too, and how important it is to protect it? Do you see the impact of the wildfires and, and maybe global warming on, on cal places like California, where it looks more dry from up there? Can you, can you see how how vulnerable we are down here and appreciate it from that perspective a little bit? I, I think probably the thing that makes me think most about how vulnerable our planet is is seeing those sunrises and you get to see that out, outline of the atmosphere uh, and it's that blues I was talking about and this the earth is a huge huge thing in our view at 250 miles above it and you can see the curve of the earth and you can see the curve of the atmosphere covering the earth and it is such a thin layer by comparison to the size of the planet and that always strikes me and makes me feel like you know hey this is something that we that we need to protect yeah i can imagine now i understand last week there was a resupply mission that was uh sending you some some pretty essential supplies and and there were some problems with that can you tell us what happened and and how does that make you feel i would imagine you two are feeling you know a little vulnerable up there well actually our planners have a you know, very detailed plan. That's what NASA does best is plan and have a backup plan for the plan that doesn't work. And it's uh, one of the things I, I admire the most about NASA is our ability to solve problems. But in this particular case, the, the, the Russian side was affected much more. They had much more cargo on board that vehicle. But we have enough supplies to last well into spring. And actually today we had a successful launch of the HTV, the Japanese cargo vehicle, which will be arriving uh, in a little over a week, and uh, we should get plenty of resupplies on that as well. So that'll take us well into next year in terms of supplies. Uh, you know, there were a few unique items that uh, obviously might be a little more difficult. The Russians lost a spacesuit, um, and you know, on one of the previous uh, Cygnus flights that uh, blew up on. Um, we also lost a spacesuit. So it's something that happens. Again, uh, has to do with the fact that space flight's not an easy thing. And uh, we just have to keep pressing ourselves to do the right thing, make, all, make sure we're doing all the right tests and keeping the quality control where it needs to be so that we don't have uh, these problems. That's awesome. I'm told I've got only one more question for you, which is if you could tell me what your plans are for the next 157 days that you're up there. It's a, it's a huge amount of time, and 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 what you're missing from planet Earth during during what you anticipate you'll be missing during that time. Well, probably the thing that I'll miss the most is food. Although our guys uh, do a great job uh, trying to give us food that we like, the lack of variety, I think, is probably the one thing that in the past, my previous experience has shown that that's the one thing that gets a little boring. Uh, in terms of other things, it's 
great to be able to have the IP phone and email access so I can talk to family and friends. And I don't really feel particularly isolated. Um, so I don't really think I'll miss them too much other than, you know, it's just in being there in person with them. But uh, it, it's great to be able to stay in touch with everyone. Well, that's uh, fantastic. So I don't really think I'll miss a lot, and I'm going to be very excited about contributing to the science program up here. Well, listen, it's an honor to speak with you, and we appreciate the, the personal sacrifice you make to be up there and your willingness to, to put yourself in a very vulnerable position, a very exciting position, too, but for the sake of humanity and exploration and, and taking us into the future and helping ignite our imagination. So it's a huge honor to speak with you, and good luck with all of your work, and we'll be thinking about you as you go 17,500 miles whipping around the, 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 the planet. Yeah, it is a great job, and I'm honored to be here. All right. You take care, Peggy. Be safe, and we'll uh, talk to you when you're back on, on planet Earth. Okay, will do. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants with Moxie Production. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure audio and video communications.